Hi everyone, um, hello, welcome to our launch this evening. Uh, my name is Jasmine, I'm from Car Connect Press and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to this launch tonight. We're launching previously unpublished work by John Ashbury, Parallel Movement of the Hands, um, which has just come out as a Car Connect classic. Um, we're joined by Emily Skillings, the editor, and we are also joined by Ollie Hazard. Um, you may know Ollie as a Carcanet poet. His most recent collection with us came out in 2018. It's called Blotter. You can find it on the website, which you should. Um, he's also written a critical book on Ashbury, and his first novel, Laura Mipsum, just came out with Prototype. Um, so you should seek his work out also. Um, I am not going to talk to you for very long, and I'm certain you all know how these events work by now, but for anyone who's new to a Carcanet event, um, we'll be here for about an hour. Um, so you're aware I will be showing the text during the readings. This should make it easier for you. Um, have a play around with your own screen if it's not to your liking. You can reconfigure that um, to suit your own needs. Please find the chat box and say hello to us. Um, we can't see you, so I'm sorry you can't turn your cameras on um, and we can't see your faces, but find the chat box, say hello to us, let us know what you think of the reading. Um, and further than that, we would like you to get involved um, by finding a different button, which is the Q&A button. Um, so if you find the Q&A button and you line up any questions that you might have for Emily or for Ollie um, for later on in the reading, um, we would like, like to get you involved in the conversation. So please do get those lined up in there um, and let us know what you want to ask. That would be great. Um, thank you for paying to be here. Um, we really appreciate your support always. I've put the link in the chat already for you to buy the book um, with your discount. I'll put it in there again now, but you'll also get it as an email tomorrow, so don't worry about that. So I think that's all of the technical admin stuff out of the way. Um, let's launch this lovely book. I'm going to invite Ollie on screen now to join me um, and we'll get going. Thanks, Asmin. Can you hear me OK? Good stuff. Um, so this uh, book, Parallel Movement of the Hands um, collects five uh, of John Ashbury's uh, long um, or serial um, poems which he left unfinished. Um, and it seems to be a really remarkable book for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, because it contains five extremely beautiful, funny, engaging, surprising poems, um, but also because it transforms our understanding of a major poet in a single gesture, um, particularly the late period of Ashbury's writing, the last two decades. Uh, I, like many other of Ashbury's readers, had been working on the uh, assumption that he had essentially abandoned longer forms um, after the publication of Girls on the Run in the late 90s. Um, so it was extremely surprising for me to um discover that this book was going to be published and to read these uh, amazing works which interact in such interesting ways with the work that he was producing contemporaneously um it, as you'll see these poems uh, include some material that found its way into other of ashbury's volumes that he did publish in the northeast um, but they stand alone as independent, discrete works as well, which allow us to, to uh, throw a new light on, on the works that we know so well. Um, this volume has been edited um, immaculately and imaginatively by Emily Skillings, um, who has done an incredible job, um, not just producing the text um, and, and finalising them, but providing this generous um, set of appendices, uh, which allow us to follow the often recondite references with, the, with which Ashbury populated his poems um, and to add some explanatory glosses and also it's got an amazing editorial introduction as well which provides this really moving account of Emily's process um, in terms of um, developing this text um, in collaboration with many others. Um, I'll just introduce Emily briefly and then she'll uh, read from uh, the book um, so I will just tell you a little bit about her. Um, Emily Skillings is the author of the poetry collection Fort Knot, 
uh, which publishes weekly called A Fabulously Eccentric Hypnotic and Hyper Vigilant Debut. She is a member of the Belladonna Collaborative, a feminist poetry collective, small press and event series in Brooklyn. She received her MFA from Columbia University School of the Arts, where she was a creative writing teaching fellow. Skillings was John Ashbury's assistant from 2010 to 2017. Oh, thank you so much, Ollie, for that incredible introduction. Um, I want to just begin by thanking you. Um, I got an amazing email this morning from Timothy O'Connor, who was Ashbery's Hudson assistant and also organized his photographic archive, as well as many other things. And he was talking to me about when he first started reading your poetry, Ollie, and he brought it up to John um, Ashbery. And Ashbery said, um, you know, Ollie Hazard is one of the best poets working today in the UK. And I remember part of my job working with Ashbery was, was doing correspondence. And when it came time to respond to you, to one of your letters to him, he would get this glow. You know, sometimes he didn't want to always respond to everybody or he had a lot of work to do, but he would always say, oh, can I resp respond to Ollie first? Um, and he would get this kind of glimmer in his eye when he got to respond to one of your amazing emails. Um, and just one other thing, there was a, Ashbery got a lot of books. They were constantly flowing in, presses would just send him books all the time. And there was a kind of hierarchy to where they were in the apartment. And, you, and your book, Between Two Windows, was always on the glass coffee table. And it maintained its status there, which is like a really high up place in, in this kind of hierarchy of space. Um, and it ma maintained its place there for forever, for years and years. Um, I remember he used to ask me to scan your poems and send them to his friends um, and email as email attachments um, and, and write about them in his correspondence. So um, it's so wonderful to be here today with such a friend to me and both to John. So thank you. And such a wonderful Ashbury scholar. Um, I also just wanted to take a moment to thank Carcanet for their continued relationship with John Ashbury's work. Um, he so valued his relationship with Carcanet and it's really special to be able to continue that with this book. Um, I also want to thank David Kermani, John Ashbury's husband, who made this book totally possible and was helpful and insightful and necessary at every stage. So thank you to David. Um, at Carcanet, I just want to quickly thank Michael Schmidt for, for his longtime friendship with Ashbury, Andrew Latimer. I want to thank T. Board and Nash Gallery for the high res um, reproduction of this Ashbury collage um, that that they they granted us permission to use on the cover, which I think is so special. I especially love this little strawberry in the corner. It's like one of my favorite things. Um, I also want to thank so much um, Jasmine for all of your hard work and Becky and John and everyone at Carcanet for making this just a really special experience. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to begin my reading tonight from the history of photography which is a long poem written in 1993 so a little earlier than some of the other works um or he, it was probably written around the time that ashbury wrote the poems and as the stars were shining um, which i believe came out in 94. Um, it's a long poem and it goes through you know the history of photography but it's not about photography as, a, as an ashbury poem but it uses it as a kind of lyric tether um, Ashbury makes reference to Maplethorpe, at Gay, um, Edward Muybridge, all of these pioneers um, in early photography. And, um, and so you'll hear some of them in these first sections, but also he's talking about lots of other things as Ashbury does. I found this poem in the basement of Ash Ashbury's Hudson home. Um, and it was quite a find. I was already putting together this book and it really, to me, kind of rounded out the collection um, when, I, when I made this find. So from the history of photography. First takers, first makers, 
The first sip of intelligence splits the diapered sky, already crackled with the losses that events are. At the old tree house, one is clogged with sleep in any case, dust garlands that sway like chains of mice. And up from under the palaver, there is golden food. So let it be clean at least. The first person to be photographed was a man having his boots cleaned. There were others in the same street, but they moved and became invisible. How calm I am. Baron de Mayer saw the horse and it too moved on, nor was the lesson of satin lost on him. It all came to seem a big joke, his cake. Besides, who would care a little later, later on? Not the house dog, the twig of coal, not the letterhead, though it is preserved, shining where the tool cannot undress the board leg under the table. It is all a, how do you say, a fancy. How could I have had such a good idea? But you know, the way they all say is a barrel times two and too much. I have been coming and going a fair share of my life and some of me is up there photographed. Like a chair listening to a Victrola record, I experience too little and know too much for the good of others in their bathing suits. Then too as much escapes me as a tailor's dummy and a photograph by At Gay, taking in everything and nothing, which caused the rain to fall one day. Another day it was fine, we were bent on pleasure. Sure enough, a skiff comes round a bend in the Thames, a glory in progress. And we haven't even to see these men, small as pickerel in the darting black, for it's hum to come to infest us too. And buildings rise one behind the other. That is the festivity in this sense, but it's like all lace paper doilies, eludes. Meanwhile, another man spoke to me about a pocket watch. I have it here in my pocket and can choose to let it go. And when all is said and won, this one is let go. Dominated by fools, he was desecrated for a time, then came of age in autumn, just as the flocks of purple storks were taking off for another climate. He ranted and was let go, recanted and was let off. The slow burn is thus the face's fixture, what it needs and has to tell. Everyone understands that as a convention, born to pester yet never released, never owned up to. Oh, but I could call you and you'd come over. Never made a dime at the swamp and some liken it, it to haze as distance is draped in the mind of the feeling man who then gets his share of surmise and stumbles off to bed, a fool in time. Two, Francis Frith released the pyramids Negra produced the agival mysteries, Mablethorpe the dissenting penis, O oh, astigmatic, in whose lone eye a chain of flattened stereoscopic eateries atones for alternating dark and light bands, whose subtle pressures never made it into history. A time of sad busyness climbing into sadness for the view always the same. But while, I need, well, but while all I need is breathiness, lesser demons thumb their noses at the moist parade, even that notion insinuates. Only a door to be discovered sooner or later. Meanwhile, what about the decoctions of nature? You know, nature, that some were swinging already. It was in fact the door to the great treasure house noted for its treasures. And all I heard was one goblin say, Grace under pressure is the only reasonable account it can give of itself. But whence comes this pressure? You want breathiness? I'll give you breathiness, but I still maintain a drop of evil, colors, causes, and effects with an ambition wholly beyond ambition, and that the sorrow is buried there. Tomorrow, though, we'll leaf through the others, see what can be patched up, and what kind of sticking tape devolves to this vastness and would-be vastness. But what, it would have turned out differently anyway, besides which it already happened. Two were in the rain. The life ballooned up through them. Light was as shoes to a frame of mind. The wind didn't know what to make of any of it and didn't realize it was an invisible, which would have helped if it stumbled into a garage, disturbing the ashes on a mechanic's cigar. Then what time, what tigers? Any of us were giddy. And it was at this point always that the light failed like bunting 
drooping against a building's dirty facade. Make that two epitaphs. Some came up to embrace, i.e. kiss you. An absinthe was sipped, a, a wry duet rehearsed, as from the corner of the room a cat emerges, slinks off, possibly to play. More girls kissed us like a fire climbing in a chimney, the song broke, then paused. Was this today ended, this event? Or could we carry it with us always, like a charm bracelet? I'm afraid some of us need redemption more than others, while you, my little man, require but a slice of recognition cut from today's loaf. Here, take it and be gone with you. And the others, there are always more others. Construe it by fanning out over an immense field, some so remote they seem but wicks, while others resemble entirely the people they've become. Look at me. I ask it only for my clothes, the coat and hat I'm wearing. It must mean something. And my plaid scarf, that must mean something too. Only one, for, only one forgets the orneriness in which we bathe and as in tedium. And this, all this, the background tends to bring out. The foreground is something else again, though. Not enough co commitments or evidence to cast it as a slow moving lava-like meaning with some grid sketched on it. And it turns to dust when you touch it. Still, there are people here and frying sounds and smells. You don't get out of it that easily. And just staying here, contemplating a watch or a resolve isn't easy either, though it can refresh like bells rolling in a sulfurous sky, luminous confections that walk you home, prop you up against the front steps and tiptoe off. Be thankful for this, I saved you. As some rich woman on a winter's morn eyes through her silken curtains the poor drudge who with numb blackened fingers makes her fire at cock crow on a starlit winter's morn when the frost flowers the whitened window panes and wonders how she lives and what the thoughts of that more poor drudge may be. In just such another way from a far anticipated world I beg the reader's indulgence. I so far it has been formulaic from the French formule and lake, just as sitting out on a journey to a fixed point is with no notion of what comes in between and without fortifying oneself with a cup of broth. What about boating? I prefer the train. At least you know it gets you there eventually, barring some loath loathsome catastrophe. It has the ground under its feet, so to speak. In a boat, you are never sure of arriving or making any progress. You could be moving backwards into a dank netherworld, not of your imagining or anyone else's, anyone's else. So let's travel by water, if you please. The light glancing off the darting waves is reward enough for any fatal inconveniences we might inherit with a shrug. And so all is vapor and threading passages through some insufficiently imaged context, a clutter. Then stay. Monotonously rings the little bell. Eakins, skunked by depression, opted for cheese rinds, a lorry driver's running balls. These are things that cannot be painted, pole vaulting figures, Moybridge's hopping woman, because one vignette sheds another, cancels its own credibility in a fever of slight adjustments, ends up a mass, twisted. It's like corn popping. And yes, I bet I know it's higher in the petrol scented wine we all end up quaffing, even getting to like. Look, Jack, I know you're my assistant. Let's end up telling each other impersonal trifles, scented picadillos, and that will have meant we collided many a day, had attitudes and took off somewhere before a recorded voice summoned up to the studio, made us stand one after the other. I bet you think it's my arrears, but I swear I'm not in this alone, that someone paged me. Anyway, what's important is how we like each other, I and without clothes sometimes, swashbuckling or sitting at a desk writing, not imagining someone is watching. I'd cover you with kisses like a wall with honeysuckle, if only I knew how to find out the right place to be in at this time, as though it mattered much in time for you and your sister. All we did was step out a moment and came back in and the earthquake and the fire following it on it destroyed everything we had ever come to know, every chance for order. Oh, but who needs these? Oh, but I know you retain a sort of consciousness of them, a seething as of breath. 
and the old verger, like some young cypress, tall and dark and straight, which in a queen's secluded garden throws its slight dark shadow on the moonlit turf, had her attention for a moment, till some audiophile blasted past us in the corridor. It was that April 27th, I think. The glittering ferry boat detached itself from the pier and pushed slowly, trustingly out onto the water. And we, we were all ashore and made a difference that time. Three, not to put a too fine a point on it, you did fit that grid rather too randomly over the maze of life-sucking tubes that forms its constituency. I've lost my patina, it seemed to shriek. And how many times would that help? Legions of fans would take it anyway to unmodel their cautiously optimistic ergotizing of the black or dark purple sclerot of the genus Claviceps that occurs as a club-shaped body which replaces the seed of various grasses as rye into a soft horny stub about the size of a chestnut occurring as a normal growth in the tufts of hair on the back of the fetlock in the horse. Who knew it was coming apart like a billboard of a driving woman being dismantled panel by panel and there is still something we can all do to outlaw it. I think we just might think we just might, but the eclogue needs your okay. And so it is not normal just to say in the drugstore, this is passable, this not, and I'll have that other one. Any more than in a bakery one should point and the whole neighborhood collapsing like a souffle of sea or sandstorm through which a father leads his sons to my office now that so much great relief has been overwhelmingly experienced. Here the bass clarinetist, bass clarinetist picks up his instrument, blows into it, twists his little finger in his ear as the scrunch, minute at first, soon unwieldy, empowers itself onto legions of the unwanted, singing, Ophelia, you, were, you too were a disaster, as much as Laertes or any Osric, but I catch you but I can catch you if you leap from that frame of flame that is your oriel window, soothe gripes and in a trice be back at my stand with none the wiser. Just as each bottle in an assembly line passes under the spigot that fills it and passes on, so too is the end of excessive noodling foreseen in the stellar almanac I hold to my chest. Let there be no more division of ecstasy. And I say, who shouldn't, never having experienced any, except face down in the noon hayfields once? What I buy, I pass around. All are unbidden to this feast of the everyday, so I can hear its partial music just as a bird sings out of reach within the edge of a forest. Let all others come if no one believes it and sample. Surely the credulous exist amid the, amid the skirts of the crowd, potential buyers of snake oil. So we let the last secret gasp out of the folds of a bonnet or shawl. And then what good is anybody's to anything? Furthermore, the door is soaked with spring rain. Meanwhile, help me out of these, I'm soaked too. Give me my scallop shell of quiet and I'll be moseying along. The hagiography of this moment is supported by meager underpinnings. That other woman, the one I knew, was she here too, or why isn't she here? I meant to speak to her as she drove past, but her pink roadster was too quick, the crescent drive spanning the harbor too seductive. I got lost in my own sense of locomotion. She owes me, therefore, but is unaware of it. I shall be in her arrears till my dying day, while she frolics on the sand like a sea urchin. The season favors her, they all do, all is ornament laid over construction. The molting seals matter little to me, the sky tigers even less, less than was vouchsafed her, and besides, her niece is in Tripoli. Building it up in the same old mystic way in the name of the goddess grammar is no doubt one important aspect of the way towards the truth. If possible, one would like to concentrate on lively things, bars, fires, Horses drag some notion of why we were put on earth along plowed fields like a harrow. And we can't say this or that is true. Only a hankering for further skin registers on the barcoding device. This is true. On to further encounters deep among reeds then. It's the unseen meeting that one values for time is less and the musician's contracts are unequivocal. 
If only I could range over the earth with you, as you, from beach to beach, the silver of your embark embarcadero pulling away in the celestial light. This is a dream of happiness. It could be mentioned. When one dunce happens out of the bracken, his ass braying, two more shall take his place on the scoreboard. For to be finished is nothing. Only children and dinosaurs like endings, and we shall all be very happy once it all gets broken off. The others then, no, no, you missed the turn off into that driveway. The others must lead you now. Um, and so the next poem I'm going to read is, is much shorter. <laughs> um, that was the first three sections of the history of, photo of photography. The next poem I'm going to read is from The Art of Finger Dexterity, which is a poem that Ashbery wrote. It's a, se a series of poems, of 28 poems that Ashbery wrote in 2007, um, based on the composition, para um, The Art of Finger Dexterity by the Austrian composer, Carl Czerny. Um, Ashbery meant to, to, to write all 50, um, poems titled after all 50 of the variations in Opus 740, The Art of Finger Dexterity, but he only completed 28. Um, but it's an incredible collection and very much in the style of late Ashbery. Um, but it, it contains this kind of shell as this, as this numbered series. Um, and it's, it's incredible. I came across an, an unpublished interview with Ashbery where he said that he played Cherny's etudes as a child. Um, so this is a um, composer that Ashbery had a deep connection to. So this is number 24, the thumb on the black keys with the hand absolutely quiet. Instead of having to stand, you projected on me your persistent language melody. The waters of the lake were roiled, came undone. If this is what bending to others' expectation leads to, I shall have to try again, but lonesome. For the waves that came along were the same as those of many years ago, as though time had dropped a stitch, which became the world we had always lived in, cheerful and dumb. I am all alone, you said, yet truly there are worse things to be, unfriendly or ungainly. As it is, you sing out of all the holes in the tree. The world is terracotta, and this rabid citizenry is now coarse and at peace. Like us in a persistent century down the block, when all kinds of ideas were beginning to exist and is quickly shriveling to naught. After that came a break. Of course, there had been a misunderstanding. It was probably better to mention it now when the light is golden than wait till its energy has been siphoned off. So it was that we became partners, fated never to meet the side of the maelstrom or the falls, yet glued in an impossible intimacy, as though the plot of an opera had come undone and some spear carriers gotten carried away, mistaking the bell tower for Mount Olympus and the flocks for Venetian pleasure boats. If one could but see it clearly all over again before closing down the exhibition permanently, why our tickets would be good as new, refundable as a Corsair's booty, but twice as glamorous. Thank you. And now Ollie is going to do a little reading. So I'm going to read 21 variations on my room. Um, and of all the uh, pieces in this book. This is the poem that shares the most material with other published and unpublished works by Ashbery. Um, it's a poem which is, uh, was intended to be in 21 parts of which only 18 were completed. Um, and you might recognize some um, aspects of the, the poem or, or large portions of it, which were published in, as Emily notes in her appendices, uh, in the poem, The Handshake, The Cough and The Kiss, uh, which was published in A Worldly Country. Um, interestingly as well, uh, it, it comes with an epigraph from Apollinaire, 
um, which is shared by a section of the Kane Richmond project, um, a, a passage from that called A Long and Sleepy History. Um, and it is accompanied there with a second epigraph from Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons, uh, which is apt so that there is no use in a centre. And one of the things that that um, tells me is that um, later in his career, Ashbury was really thinking about the, um, the domestic space as a, a space of experimentation in the way that Stein saw it um, and, and a, an area of real potential productivity. Um, the epigraph from Apollonaire is Ma chambre à la forme d'un cage um, from his poem Hotel. Um, so I'm just going to read this now. I'm not going to read the numbers, um, having uh, gone back and forth about whether or not to do that. Um, so just uh, but since you can see them, I won't read them. The single best way to do it, resined and unresonated, take back the adjectives. Out of the pure blue sky to any functions at all, cheap and solid and fun. The single best way to do it, you don't have to wear wet pants. I'm sure you do. Laws of enclosure are wonderful opportunity. You have an infected lip. Home on deranged is all. Homage to boys who won, not sparing the dull token of grief beyond all the wisdom. Who won then are no longer clear to ours. Making them weapons like. A good grill for outdoor cooked meals on a closet shelf, peace and a sheaf of mental notes to put misery out of its misery. We need to crawl from the gravel drive over to the garage. Newly ornate wheels like creeper, bands of brick, moulage, stammers, masonry from where last let go. The pallet of palace overcomes evening do's and don'ts. In my dream, I was in Paris, upstairs in a large, rather shabby house. Someone downstairs had called for a cab. It had arrived, was blocking traffic. The driver seemed lost and there were already passengers inside. Did I know where the cinema Crito was? Oh yes, I said confidently, in French. We climbed in next to the others who were nice, disposed to receive us. Every year at this time of day, I get a feeling of a pain like roses and dried figs. Nobody needs to know what is ailing me, which is sad, but telling them would be worse. I say, would you mind if I light up in bars? There's no place left to smoke. I wonder about taxis. I used to smoke in taxis because it was forbidden in the subway. That was before I gave up smoking, watching the flies or files drift up to, upward, wretched in grey dust. And if a child came over to play, it would be asked its name and given a dose of brandy so as not to play anymore. We risk it anyway, out on the ice where it darkens and seems to whisper from down below. Watch out, it's the Snow Queen, no one said. She likes playing as long as she's not involved. That seemed to make sense, but what was I to do with no trains till next morning and a good sense of humour, someone said. Next day, the hills were parchment, good to look at from far away, which is where we always are anyway. I dressed hurriedly, consumed a hasty breakfast. Now it seemed there were pairs of people thronging, telling me what to do. As you know, if there's, as you know, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's that. Turns out I don't stand it. People were treating me nicer as though I'd stood up for myself, which is something I'd never do. Father and his little house took a bath. It was almost time for the news. The trolley arrived in time for dinner. Next day, a disoriented child told you where to look for the cash under the sofa. We took a walk toward the cathedral. It missed us twice, I think. The pavement of white chocolate curves around the angle and is lost. Turns out it's lost. A patient's what happened is what the first place is considering zebra crossing and that doesn't include possible others that may have been reported i'm ice in the house and not the first either a tad mighty i'm forever yours his wings caress me nightly turns out the bill was sent but to the wrong address we have no credit rating anymore we must try to live without it and the unsuitable caresses of oldsters gone to the gym or the country one wall features old billboards offering a trip to the seashore in 45 minutes. With that, we can pick up and get lost. Far into the night, the argument stitches its way. 
How long can we go on and comprehend it? There is more here than meets the eye. I was right about that. And in the name of solid fun, how much more decency can these elastics take? Plenty, unfortunately. So on my day off, I took the long trek out of the city. My reward is solitude, so get a life. It's been real, I mean really real, like you can't imagine it, so I must be going. The city was leaving anyway, closing its ranks behind him. Soon no one would remember the boy in Dross who used to come and stare through the skateboards at the abandoned furniture warehouses. And surely this was not a reproach, not to him for coming with his charts and other paraphernalia, for no one, not even his mother, could figure out what to ask him, nor what outlandish reply he would come up with, even if he answered, as indeed he never did. So they got on well during the first semester. The city and its pepper-pot domes that day were a good time to be in, and out from the lattices a pleasant breeze was wafting, and in that breeze mingled tones of melody like adjusted spices. Then it was all over. He felt well, he never said so. Oh, oh, I don't know. It travelled under him until he was going to be sick in the pit of his stomach where ailments dwell. Nobody had to remind the boy to hang up his shoes that day. He was already in them, hobbling off to the cobblers to buy some new laces of the kind worn in the port city of his birth. They'd never seen this hour of the flying kite and the spitball hanging down, trying to unlatch the year. They all knew him in that ancient, wondrous and miserable town as the local amateur historian and vendor of a kind of chili only the Huri knew about. Then as if turning his face away, he tried to guess the answers to their riddles. If correct, a kiss would reward him. If not, a turning away of a sheet of paper or promise to better himself in huge academic pools some kilometres away. They didn't tell him this. There was no formal inquiry into his tussled penmanship but all that led him unto the doctorate of his dreams and a cottage close to the bridge traffic where daily the seams are let out at evening. It was a pretty enough place, though quiet. One has to endure certain systems, then profit by them later in the crust of events. We reject these. Oh, I am sure it was as serious then to be struggling as it is now. We were children, which made it easier, but harder as well because we didn't know anything. Now we have survived, you might say, but just look at the results. Few factors have entered the equation, but the surround is as messy as ever, and even more limitless. The one city that accepts these excuses is strange to us. It doesn't surprise me. The words had an unpleasant ring. Hanging out with Baptists, drinking temperance beverages, is another kind of education to which one is accustomed during the long nights of autumn. It comes as no surprise to learn that winter is on the way with headlands and diamond regrets and the likeness. Still hungry? Read on. Shopping where history and kindness meet, two strangers clamp the gavel to the Keated wellhead. Nothing you nor I can say can undo what they said, but was it anything? A group of wilted children poured the tar from where it looked out on a film of ashes to the horizontal bars, or it was arranged to look like some other unknown hour a circumstance of such kidney as to bemuse purple assailants. They left the drum on. From the radiator to the city centre, it led to indecent bragging and imbroglios. Perhaps it's time to change the frequency of what is seen around us. Leave the palace and go home. A chariot awaits, waits beside the door. The way in is blocked by the entrance, near it. I don't know. Spring came and went so far this year, sex on the river, the chosen advice, and more. Once the foreplay is over, the real mess can begin, and one observes it. I had no idea it was so complete, Mrs. Swift continued, as they passed the dock area with its numerous boats and the play fields for tennis, baseball, and the other sports. The launching area is directly ahead. After that is the supervisor's area, and you could go home now except they are expected here, and wonderful to behold, are painted silver grey with a red rose, and at the base were three red fins on which the rocket seemed to be poised. The one farther over is the dummy, Tom explained. The flaming jet lifters lowered it onto a carpet of specially built heat-resistant boiler plate, or <laughs> boiler iron splash plate. A few moments later, Sandy Swift made a perfect landing in a small jet plane. I hope you get the rest of the day off, genius boy. But said shyly.
Thank you much, so much, Ollie, for that amazing reading of that poem. It's so interesting that, as you said, it shares so much text with other poems, and it's it, and it you know it was really interesting to see how Ashbury transitioned from this poem to the handshake, the the Kafka kiss, like what was shed and what was added. Um, so, I, and I'd never heard it read aloud, so it was really special. Well, and thank you for your amazing reading as well. Um, I, but I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions um, while we have time. Um, you, you started your reading by describing the circumstances in which you first encountered the history of photography, which frankly makes me um, panic a little bit. The idea that there's this poem just in Ashbury's basement, potentially undiscovered. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you encountered each of these works and, and when was the moment where you first thought that maybe that they could be joined together and, and turned into a publication? Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, makes me nervous too. Um, so um, something that's maybe a little different about this book is that I didn't go kind of searching through, for the most part, Ashbury's archives to find mm -hmm. unpublished material. Um, most, except for the history of photography, which which was found um, as a, as a photocopy in in the basement of the, of the Hudson home, most of these works were found just in in Ashbury's house, just kind of you know in in, in folders, kind of lying around. And um, I I discovered them at a time that I was I was organizing the poems that Ashbury had written after his his final collection, Commotion of the Birds. So I was photocopying them. I was making sure that all of his changes had been integrated. Some of them had been published in periodicals. And I decided, um, along with David Carmani, oh, it might be interesting if I went back and, and found some of the poems that Ashbury hadn't included in his in his collections over the years that he had liked, that he had published in journals, but just hadn't included in books. And I go into the introduction why he didn't include some of these poems that he really liked in the books. They, they repeated similar themes from, from the poems that were in the collections, et cetera. So there are all of these kind of great, more late Ashbury poems that hadn't been published. And so as I was gathering those, I, you know, I loved them. Many of them had been published in journals and periodicals and, and I was um, making photocopies of them and making sure all the changes had been integrated properly. Um, and as I was doing that, I came across in a folder, um, a kind of section of this, of, of this file cabinet that seemed to house a few unfinished projects. And one of them I had actually forgotten that I had um, encountered before. I had actually made photocopies of it, made a folder of it like early in my tenure as John's assistant, um, not really realizing, oh, this is this amazing manuscript. It was the art of finger dexterity. And my, but there is my handwriting on the folder. And I had no memory of this until I encountered it. Um, it was during a time when I was really sad and very much still mourning John. And I was helping to pack up um, his and David Carmani's apartment in New York City in Chelsea. And um, so I had this pile of other poems, which are just very kind of similar to Ashbury's late style that had been purposefully excluded from, from his books. And then I found these other poems, which felt very different. They felt like kind of misfit. Um, and they were unfinished or in a state of like unfinishedness, right? The, the scope of unfinishedness. I use unfinished very loosely um, as a term in this book. Some of them kind of just end, right? Like the one you just read, which ends with um, quotations from this book. Um, this is the actual book that Ashbury used, Tom Swift in his rocket ship. Um, and uh, some of them are, you know, unfinished in a way like they hadn't been, they hadn't gone through the, the process that Ashbury usually put his poems through before they were published. Um, and so I got all excited. I, you know, I talked to David Kermani. Um, I talked to Farnish Bhatti, who was my amazing, um, she was a kind of an editor, another editor early on in the process of this book and really helps a lot. You think about working with original manuscripts. Um, 
And I was so excited by these works. Yeah, Tom Swift and his rocket ship. Yeah, the Tom Swift books are, 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 are very interesting. They're quite, they're very racist. <laughs> um, um, but, but John collaged from them in the, in, the, in the Cane Richmond Project and 21 Variations on My Room. Um, but where was I? I just felt like these are these new textures of, of John and they, um, I talked to Eugene Ritchie who edited his selected prose and was one of his dearest friends um, and co-edited his collected translations. And Ritchie was like, oh yeah, I remember these works. I remember John writing these works. I think he didn't publish them because they didn't fit in with other things that he was writing at the time. And that really inspired me once I knew that. I was like, okay, they, they weren't these, you know, things that he abandoned because he didn't like them. They were things that just didn't really fit in with what he was publishing at the time. And that's, and I, you know, I got the sense speaking with Kermani that, that Ashbury wasn't so sure about the idea of, you know, someone digging through the archives and just publishing everything in sight, right? And so this felt like a way to kind of publish something posthumously, but these were things that were kind of still in progress that had just been kind of abandoned, but they were still living with him, right? They were, they were in a file cabinet in a drawer just a few feet away from where he was living and being. Um, and it, it made me really consider this idea of like what stops a, a poem, which is a question I ask in the introduction, it made me really reflect on why I've stopped writing things um, or why I haven't you know, included things in books, so. Yeah. That's so fascinating, Emily. Um, and this idea um, that these poems have a kind of particular value because of their ongoing state, their kind of openness, their unfinishedness. That's so interesting because, and for, for me, again, like um, one of the things you negotiate really um, clearly and openly in the introduction is the problem that as an editor of Ashbury is that his aesthetic in his most finished works um, in, always includes this like streak of unfinishedness, right? Um, in, in the ways that you describe. So um, you, 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 this kind of, um, the question of the, the final status of these works crystallizes around that, that single term, uh, unfinishedness, which you prefer to um, uh, kind of uh, like conclusiveness or, or incompleteness. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm also interested in how you, just on a like practical basis, how you decided how to finish these texts, like, because you had to make editorial choices, didn't you, about particular words. How did you approach that? It was very difficult because, you know, when you're, um, Roseanne Wasserman taught me the, the, the phrase crux. Like a, a like a crux in a, in a manuscript, right? You come to this thing that's a problem, right? It's a, in the manuscript, and um, they were so exciting to come across. And one that I just read um, in the history of photography, Ashbery writes, "When all is said and one, O N E, one is let go." And I had to think, did he just leave the D off? Is that when all is said and done? And I thought, no, you know, John love, you know, would love to play with a phrase like that. And so it was really a case by case basis. Um, and, you know, I've been an editor for a long time, but I've never worked with original manuscripts and especially never worked with original manuscripts when the author was not present. So I wanted to tread very lightly and err on the side of what was there. And that was something that Farnoosh Fati really taught me how to do um, and she, in her work editing the amazing Joan Murray book that that she did, um, there was a there's a great moment in the um, in the Kane Richmond project where there was a word that was spelled in a way where it could either be omnipotent or impatient, and even John didn't know what the word was. He had written omnipotent question mark impatient question mark, and I wrote it out like on a big on a big piece of paper and like pinned it to my wall. And, you know, I did, I did come to the conclusion of impatient um, because of context and because of the misspelling, the, the word impatient was, was closer, even though it started with an O. 
Um, but so those are just some examples of, of places and they were really fun. Like it was so fun to, to figure out which word I was gonna use, but then for really significant ones like impatient, omnipotent, um, I wanted to leave an, uh, a trace in case I was wrong. Um, and so that was kind of the reason why I started the appendices. And then I, you know, for fun, added some references. Although I did not do as a, an exhaustive job as like, you know, say Mark Ford in the Library of America, who has these wonderful and really comprehensive notes. Mine was just like, kind of what I wanted to look up. <laughs> um, but But yeah, it was really fun, but it was really hard, right? Because it limits possibility um in the text um and john is all about you know openness and and possibility so um i tried to to tread lightly as lightly as possible and really trust the manuscripts but then when something was an obvious error um i know john wouldn't want an op like an obvious error in a poem and would never have wanted that so those things i just kind of cleaned up <laughs> yeah that's so fascinating. Um, I think the, the the title of the book kind of catches that um, sense that what we're offered here um, through your kind of editorial intervention, intervention, but also through John's own practice of re revision, recycling, and reusing of material, is the sense that there are these kind of multiple iterations of a text which occur and continue just simultaneously. Um, which is you know why this book is such a pleasure and so enriching. Um, and instructive um, for, for all of us who love his work. I wonder um, if we might just finish, um, Ali, I've just got one question I, I would like to pass on from the, um, the, the Q&A right. section um, about um, like other potential um, unpublished works of Ashbury, if we'd like to, like to see uh, uh, other editions of this kind or yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of unpublished work. Um, but as, um, as I said earlier, you know, I wasn't so sure about, about Ashbury's feelings about, about what, um, what that might look like in the future. But, but, you know, there, there is a lot of work that's yet to be published. And I, and, you know, and I think that, you know, Mark Ford has done an incredible job um, putting on, previously unpublished work in the Library of America editions. There are always really exciting finds um, in those in those books too. So I think there's definitely a possibility, but I don't have any any plans to to do another one. It was a very personal book for me because it was literally just kind of stuff that I found lying around while I was very sad and missing John a lot. Um, and and coming across these, these works was just kind of such a gift. Um, but, but yeah, there's so much, there's, there's likely a lot more in the archives, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, um, I mean, do you want to finish by reading some of the, uh, this amazing um, final poem, The Kane Richmond Project? Yeah, sure. I just, this, this question from Ian, I just want to, I just love this question, so yeah. I just want to briefly address this. So, so, hi Ian, I'm so glad you're here. Um, there's, you know, one of the most interesting things in these texts was that John was um, actually annotating where he got a lot of the collaged material. So for example, he would be like, Tom Swift in his rocket ship, page 72, next to a quote. Um, or, you know, in the, in the history of photography, the poem that I read, I, there's a, in italics, there's a Matthew Arnold quote from Sorab, Sorab and Rustum. Um, and he noted that in the margin. And I thought that was so generous of him. Like, even though it wasn't going to be in the poem, it was in the manuscript because he wanted to remember where it came from. Um, and he obviously wanted someone else in the future maybe to, to know where he was pulling this material from. Um, these poems are so intertextual and so ekphrastic, but in, indirectly ekphrastic in the way that Ashbury is always ekphrastic. Um, and so, I got the sense that he was just pulling things, you know, even in the last manuscript, maybe pulling things from Turner classic movies, you know, films that he had seen. Um, he has that great poem, They Knew What They Wanted, where every, where it's all movie titles that begin with they, that he got from a, from a film guide. Um, so he was, he was just such a voracious consumer of 
all different kinds of media and things just really stuck in and they stick in the palms. Um, so it was great to get a sense of that looking at the original manuscript. This is why I wanted to include some of the facsimiles in the book as well. Thank you for that question, Ian. Sorry, it was just good. I wanted to answer it. Um, yeah, should we read from the end, Ollie? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, great. So, give me a nod when you're in. Um, so we're gonna like round robin this, which is my favorite way to read anything because you get little breaks. Um, I, we're gonna do a slight imp improvisation. So this is from the Kane Richen Project, which is a really weird, amazing manuscript. It was about 35 pages type of typescripts. Um, and it was all out of order. David Kermani really helped to put it in, in a, an official order. Um, and this is towards the end. Kane Richmond, I have a photo of him, was this hunky, look how handsome, <laughs> was this hunky serial actor that John kind of became interested in. And John loved um, serial films. And uh, the um, book is littered with film references. I couldn't even look all of them up from B movies to silent films. Um, but some of the characters in it are Kane Richmond, who was in um, many serials um, in the 1940s and 50s, I believe, and um, Rin Tin Tin Jr. as Rin T. Um, but here towards the end, we kind of get to see one of these Kane Richmond serials um, in the poem. It's this prose poem um, mostly prose poem, but then also has lineated sections separated by intertitles, kind of like a, a serial um, text. Um, so we're going to start on page 172. And I'm going to read from my book, actually. Um, Come right in and sit down. Can I offer you something? A glass of sparkling cider, perhaps? How it doesn't sparkle. It's a bit lonely here, which is mostly my fault. The window panes are tinted a faint violet, which causes a wistful light in the room that one isn't wholly aware of. I should have them replaced, but they're old and very valuable. A few have been broken and replaced, and the resulting mismatched brightness here and there is unsettling. I'm the first and no doubt the last to admit it. Don't try talking to Doris and Dolores. There'd be no point. They're in a photograph window shopping in Oxford Street circa 1937 or 1936. They seem very smartly turned out, don't you agree? Dolores in her little leopard cape and matching talk, Doris in a dark pillbox hat in which, in whose veil black pom-poms are embedded. That way, I just want to say something about that line. That was that John had changed black orbs to pom-poms and I was kind of sad about that because I liked black orbs. <laughs> black pom-poms were are embedded. Soon they will enter a large movie palace near Leicester Square. The feature hasn't begun yet, but there's a newsreel with Mussolini ranting about Ethiopia or something. Next is a serial starring the Amer American actor Kane Richmond, a tall, dark, good-looking man who seems to prefer the company of horses and dogs to that of men, as well as women. Maybe that's why his shyness seems about right. Dolores is already groping in her purse for a handkerchief. The villains have Kane trapped in a barn and are starting to set fire to it. Then it's all over, for this week at least. The feature is beginning and the music wells up very lively and somber. It's a romance starring the lovely Greta Gint. Pass me a mint, dear. I'm afraid my mascara is streaked. It must look awful in this rapid play of flashing lights and shadows. Heavens, it seems the projector is broken. We'll have to wait in the dark. Only they've turned the lights up now. Somebody is going to make some kind of announcement. Or perhaps a nicely buttered roll would satisfy. A taste like chestnut flooded his head. Doorbell rang, sweet kitties sang. It was dark down in his pants when he crouched over to see where the taunting was coming from, while wee kittens emoted on the floor. There was so much to see, oversee, always. Sometimes it comes in the form of delayed correspondence. Those wilted irises you threw out had been sent months ago by an admirer, someone who knew your preferences, that you liked their limited color and fragrance. Now it's hopeless to find the accompanying note, unless you remember where you put it. Unlikelier than it seems, though not beyond the remotest likelihood. 
we shall oversee these, but there will be other collateral descendants, ocean broad, until you get the feeling again. Again, there is nothing remote about it. Arguably, the park light forecasts rangers. Their oxides exit with the clamor of breeze. No one knows how many there are. Nobody has ever counted them, which can seem strange given the iconic presence, but really not so much as having been given over to selectivity and passive anger. What about you? More nuts and bolts to which you wish you was living up to? The strange side riders were there, but no one knows when it could have been a century ago, he assented. Everybody's always been interested in meanders, hero and meander. So I think you need to stand up to door, have some more rhubarb grunt. Where was I? An unspecified amount. I love this. <laughs> I love this little moment of Kafka and, and J.A. Someone must have been telling lies about John A. It happened this way. All day long, he would sit on the front porch watching people in cars go by, tugging on his briar pipe. Except for his meals, which he took at the kitchen table, he would remain on the porch from dawn until it got quite dark, summer and winter, except for periods of extreme cold. Even then he could survey the, the street through a species of panopticon he had rigged up, which he liked to say was better than television since it was free and never required adjustment. He said this mostly to himself since he rarely spoke to others, having little occasion to do so. He was not one of these people who sit and wave at cars and passers-by with a cheery greeting. The one exception to his code of silence was Rachel, his cleaning woman who came twice a week, and even then his speech concerned mainly practical household matters. One day a fuller brush man happened by and undiscouraged by John's laconic replies to his attempts at small talk, seated himself in the wicker chair where John would sit to read the newspaper. It was the only piece of porch furniture except for a glider where he would recline and occasionally take a nap, though this rarely happened since it prevented him from observing the activity in the street. Finding that his observations concerning traffic and the weather were not rebuffed, and scarcely encouraged, the man proceeded to expand on other topics such as the decline of the neighbourhood, Trey Modere. This irritated and frustrated John, who had been expecting a sales pitch for the brushes, and had already begun preparing a reply to the effect that he was amply provided with cleaning utensils and employed a person whose duties included ascertaining that nothing was lacking in that department. He had begun casting about for other ways of ridding himself of this test, when the latter suddenly startled him by drawing his attention to a large package which the postman had evidently left next to the front door, whose mail slot would have been too narrow to accommodate it. What do you suppose is in there? The stranger asked, a bit impertinently, it seemed to John. Oh, it's probably some boots I ordered from L.L. Bean, John answered shiftily, aware as he did so that the package obviously contained nothing of the sort, and that he had just unwittingly opened new avenues in a conversation in a conversation that was fast becoming vexatious. The salesman, however, let the matter rest there, or was he considering the most effective way to irk John even further? Fried mackerel and frozen peas. If only for that, you see, she'd accepted to go on, to go only as far as the parking garage, like a blanket, like a metallic cast of the air that obscures its tint and original purpose. She was being dragged back to answer the questions in the questionnaire that seemed to require no answers, since the question had already been asked in almost identical wording, questions about the color of the eyes. And, ho and oh, I think so, know too much about me. It doesn't care. The others are old and arise from their griefs as from a deep sleep. I must have had this dream someone, someone's accepted as part of me. I have only to dress for it to be over now. The king sent his heralds throughout the land to try and find me, and the end one of them did. I refused to go with him, so the king himself came to my cottage door and rapped three times. Then, and only then, did I let him in. We had a nice long conversation in which we touched on many things, including my future and college education. If it could matter now, it would matter only to the sleep that awaits me and to this old piece of carpet. How long have you been here, chum? I never saw you before and it's as though you have always been here, a part of my life and an important one at that. It's that you don't want to bore me with your being, isn't it? 
that's nice of you, but I'm clearing out. College, that's a tricky one. Maybe I'll just stay somewhere, someplace like, there's lots of new openings. Air, the air is rife with possibilities. Just don't tell anybody I told you about it. That would be the end, friend, the end. The point is to find an extra sensual way to be without it. In the 16th century, this could have been accomplished without anybody's realizing it. Dogs would have run off as the wind picked up. So many people stuck in motion up ahead can't deliver it. The ice man is there. So what if muslin is the new medium? Her, her brother Mary was standing there, a stone finch. It was time to take a pee, to turn back. It was time to head for home. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ollie. In that last piece, um, that doubling of in a conversation was in the original mm. script. And that was something I had to decide whether or not to keep in. And I, I opted to keep it in because it, it made the, the, the conversation seem all the more like a trap, right? It's like a conversation <laughs> within a conversation, even though it might have been a, you know, a typo, I, I elected to, to keep it. Um, thank you so much for reading that with me. And thanks so much to everyone for coming. Um, yes, to reiterate those, thank, thank you guys so much. It was absolutely amazing to hear you read those poems. I had such a good time tonight. Um, congratulations, Emily, on publishing this new book. Well done. And thank you so much um, for all the work that's gone into it. Thanks, Ollie, for being here and for your questions and your reading. Um, and thank you guys for coming to support and get involved. Um, Thanks for sending your questions in. Um, it's been it's been so fun. I, I, I love hearing those poems aloud. So um, thank you guys again. Um, I know we've run over time, so thank you for sticking with us. Um, let me put the message. I'm I'm so I'm so consumed by listening to you. I can't remember what I'm going to say at the end of a reading. Um, I'm putting the link and the discount code in the chat for you guys. Check your emails tomorrow. Um, it'll come as an email as well, so you don't need to do it now. Definitely go and buy the book if you haven't, um, and use your discount code. Okay. Um, yeah. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, the last thing I need to say is please join us again next time. Um, our next launch isn't for two more weeks. Um, we're launching Alex Wong's second collection, Shadow and Refrain. Um, he's going to be joined by John Clegg, so that'll be another good evening. Uh, so please check the website for details, and um, we'll see you again, hopefully, in the future. So I think that's everything from us. Uh, thanks again, guys, um, and thank you all so much. Um, I'll turn our cameras off. I'll leave the chat open so you can get your last-minute messages in there. Um, but that's everything from us, so thanks, guys, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, Becky. Bye. Bye.